been in the justice system for I've been in the justice system for 38 years. So I've worked in various aspects of um the justice system. I used to be a correctional officer when I was a student at the University of Toronto studying for my criminology degree. I worked as a court registrar and then I went to law school. And um I can't say that I knew or I was destined to work in private practice as a sole practitioner because while I was in law school, I worked as a refugee protection officer at the Immigration and Refugee Board. So I worked for the federal government as a refugee protection officer. So I'd be doing Immigration and Refugee Board hearings during the day and I'd go to Osgood for night school. So that was that was a great thing about Osgoode Hall Law School that they had classes in the day and classes at night. And some of the classes uh, were classes that um, covered the same subject matter that um, was covered during the day. I article that wrote Swartz and Associates and um, there were great lawyers there. There was Charles Rhodes there um, he's an icon in the civil rights movement. Um, he died now. Uh, th there was his daughter, Kiki Rhodes. There was um, Peter Rosenthal, who was a professor at U of T, as well as um, a social justice lawyer. Um, Jackie Esmond, who is still doing great work. Uh, so there was a lot of progressive lawyers there. And um, I learned a lot about... Um, not only be an activist, but also running law, a law firm. So, um, I was so lucky because Charles Roach took me under his wings. And so uh, when he was doing the war, the war uh, crimes trial in um, Tanzania, I was, I was running, I was helping to run his practice. So and taking care of things that he couldn't take care of while he was in Africa. So um, I learned a lot and um, and it, it certainly uh, propelled me to um, to where I could um, could have run my own law firm after um, getting caught at the bar. Now, when I got caught to the bar, and it's probably the same thing or even worse now in 2024. You know, law school is very expensive. And so you you come out of law school and you come out burdened with uh, student loans and you're indebted so, so many places. And so uh, one has to really uh, figure out, well, where you're going to work and you know, are you going to do stuff that you like? How are you going to make money so that you could pay off these loans and make a profit so that you could pay yourself and hire staff because it's important. So it almost seems like I'm going into insight now. It's important for you to be able to do what you like but also make money so that you could pay yourself, you can live a good life, you can have staff, and um, you can you can pay for the disbursements. I mean, if you're doing legal aid cases, as some of you know, um, you know, legal aid pays, well, you, you, you don't bill legal aid every month, you bill them once or twice during the life of the file. And uh, you, you've got your fair share of pro bono cases, and um, you got to find ways to make money. So you might do, you know, it's good if you, so if you if you like doing activism cases, so I do a lot of cases centered on racial profiling, right? Those are the cases that I like. I used to do a lot of the demonstration, the encampment protest cases and so on. I still do a few from clients who I knew for years and they come to me and I might take their case on, but I don't do much of that anymore. But those are cases where they're public interest cases, the clients don't have money, but the cases raise some nice constitutional law issues or human rights issues, and so you take them on. 
So you have to find ways to make money. So if you if you have like a niche as well, you know, some securities law or, you know, civil litigation, or you can do some human rights cases, at least 10 of them and settle them a year, settle 10 cases a year, then you're good to go in terms of bringing in enough money to hire staff and pay yourself a, a good wage. I mean, so, so the thing about it is insights. Let me see what I should tell you. Um, because this is important. A lot of, if you, if you look at, um, presidents or if you president, that's a, a, a legal magazine. If you look at the Canadian lawyers weekly, if you look at law times, you'll see a lot of senior, um, senior, uh, big law lawyers now are going into private practice after practicing for with firms for many many years they've they're they're recognized the value of working for themselves controlling their own dockets controlling their own hours etc but you have to um you have to register a business name for your firm and um the thing about being a sole practitioner it happens to every junior lawyer, but it happens more to sole practitioners than anyone else. The law society is going to audit you in your first year, and audits can be very stressful. So you have to hire a bookkeeper and and you have to hire an accountant to keep rec to keep your books and records and to manage your reconciliations, etc. It's it's very important because. If you go on the law society, well, if you go on Canley and you look at the disciplinary, the disciplinary decisions from the law society's um, tribunal, you'll see a, it's a lot of racialized persons, whether they're black or brown or other ethnicities, because um, the mentorship is important and you have to know it even when you're in law school. That you have to keep proper books and records. There's no. There's there's no way around it. It's for it's you know it's for the public interest, but it's also for accountability purposes. Right, you have to docket your hours. I mean, I mean the frustration is young lawyers don't want to. They don't. They find doing dockets to be tedious, but doing dockets are part of accountability. I have my black book. I just opened a new one because the the one that I was using, um, I filled it up already. But I I keep paper records and electronic records. I use I used to use PC law, but I use Cosmolex now because PC law is is um it's 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 ending its lifespan. But um, so you have to keep proper records. You have to open a general account and you have to open the trust account. And trust account is a mixed trust account that manages clients' money. It's not your money until you pay your expenses on behalf of the client or you send them a bill and you're taking their money, which is part of yours now. But until you, those are the only two conditions really where you can take money out of a trust account. You're paying clients' expenses or you're billing or or you you have a real estate practice and and the money is going from vendor to purchaser or purchaser to vendor, and you also have to um, pay your law society dues, and you have to pay your law pro or your insurance fees. So, so you have to bring in money so that you could pay all these expenses because it could be quite daunting and expensive expensive when you just started practicing because of course. If you're appearing in the Superior Court of Justice or the Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court, you have to have robes, robes and tabs, and you know you have to have proper clothes to go there. You can't just show up in a suit to the Superior Court or the Court of Appeal or Supreme Court, right? You have to have robes, so that costs money as well. But so, but um, you know the thing about it is, you also have to do a lot of networking with um, friends, uh, family. 
um, go to events, join, you know, uh, joining, for example, the Canadian Association of Black Lawyers, the South Asian Bar Association, um, the, the Chinese Legal Clinic, or Neighborhood Legal Services, any any community organization or a legal aid organization that has a specific constituency, um, they all have senior lawyers there. And those senior lawyers would get calls to about cases. And if you're found to be reliable, if you're found to be hardworking, if you're found to be smart enough, because some lawyer some lawyers can be very lazy. They don't want to put into intellectual effort. And you can't you can't a lawyer isn't gonna refer all the clients to you if you're not prepared to do the work. Um in my career I have over a thousand reported decisions and um, at all levels of court. But even as a junior lawyer, um, my first my first week being called to the bar, I appeared in a in a case called Bangura versus Washington Post, and there were 50 media interveners in that case. Uh, my first year, I did an inquest into the death of someone at the jail. And I did a lot of injunctions during my first year. That's how I made a lot of money. I was able to pay off my, I was able to pay off all my student loans, everything in my first year, because I had a niche practice. I was representing young black children who were suspended and expelled from schools. And I learned how to do injunctions and injunctions is like, it's like one of the biggest things you could do in law. But and if you know to do it, then you can really make a lot of money. In 2024, an injunction now is a, a, the least the, the least cost for an injunction is a hundred thousand dollars. So you can do two or three injunctions a year and you're even good. You know, you just have to know the test for injunctions and you have to know how your clients how your clients might have fit in it. But that's what I was doing as a young lawyer. I was doing injunctions, plus I had criminal matters. I don't know how I did it. I was doing, I had a hundred or more cases in my first year as a lawyer, because I was doing a lot. As long as you take on a high profile case, your name is in the papers, your name is on television, you're on radio, you're on the internet. And so people are like, yeah, I need to call Selwyn. And people still do it. People still feel they need to call Selwyn. And I got to tell them, well, you know, I'm transitioning now. So not taking on as many cases as I used to. You know, but um, I'm looking for a young lawyer to take over my practice. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get into more adjudication now. But I, I can't leave and get into adjudication well, I can, because if I get appointed as the judge, then everything is a hard stop. But if I get appointed as a judge tomorrow, there's no way I can practice law. So I have to, I'm going to have to wrap the practice up and clients are going to have to find lawyers to take over. But I'm trying to um, find young lawyers who I can mentor. It's probably 10 minutes. I don't want to run into my colleagues' time. just happened and, and it just happened because I knew my work it's all a matter of knowing your work since I was in first year of law school when I was in first year of law school uh, well no second year of law school there was a major supreme court decision came out called Blanco versus British Columbia that dealt with um, delays in tribunals and CBC called me to interview me on Blanco, sent me the um, head note from the Supreme Court the day before. 
and I'm a law student, and I'm I'm being interviewed on national television about a case that came down. When I was also in law school, you know, I had I was dealing with Professor Carol Alward from um, Dalhousie. I was dealing with Professor April Beery even before I got into law school from University of Toronto Law School. And I was dealing with a lot of issues dealing with um, social justice matters with these professors. So um, I had developed a reputation already before graduating from law school as an advocate. And even when I was articling, when I was articling at Charlie Roth's law firm, I brought in 30 clients. Can you believe it? You know, he who pays the piper calls the tune and he he or she who brings in money and the young lawyers have to know that. He who brings in money to these firms have a lot to say. So when I was, when I was articling, people were coming to that law firm because of me. By the time I, by the time I was ready to be called to the bar, 90% of the cases that I had were cases where people came to that law firm simply because I was there. And so um, I had an understanding of my worth. I had an understanding of, of you know, because um, um, Ruth Swartz was very big on docketing. It's a private law firm. And you, you get to see the you get to see the invoices generated from PC law. I got an opportunity to get an understanding of, of my value and my worth. So um, when I got caught to the bar, um, the negotiations didn't go well. And uh, Mr. Roach told me, he said, I'm gonna make all I'm gonna make my staff available to you so that you could probably you could get set up. And the thing about it is the bookkeeper that I have right now. She has worked. She has worked for me since I was an article student at Charlie Rhodes Law Firm. Because when he died, I inherited her. So she, she, she's worked. She's worked for me, uh, for twenty three years. Yep, but um, but you, you know, um, you have to find office space. But it's twenty twenty four now, so you can have virtual office space. But you can also, you know, do a work here where you have a place where there's an office that you could go in and with a boardroom. You can rent boardrooms when you have to meet with clients. You don't clients don't have to know that you don't have an office. But with rent with work share now, you can just go in there and you 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 just rent an office for a day or rent a boardroom for an hour or two. And you can you can expose the clients to a nice environment so you could get into relationships. You know, I'm, I'm sure progressive law firms like Goldblatt's probably have extra offices on their floor that they rent out to lawyers um, whose philosophy aligns with them. You know, but you need to hire, in addition to a bookkeeper and um, an accountant, you need to hire a legal assistant. Now, you can hire a legal assistant from from Goldblatt's or one of those firms, you know, you can hire a part-time legal assistant. You can call one of the lawyers and say, look, I'm just starting out a sole practitioner law firm and I need I need help in terms of legal assistance or, or something else. And if they trust you, they'll say, okay, we can we can let you use our legal assistant um, from time to time and um, and we'll bill you for the services that the legal assistant provides. So sometimes you can, you can have that arrangement with law law firms, um, boutique and, and medium sized law firms, um, that have the infrastructure in place. You know, but you all you always and the thing about it is I forgot to tell you. And I have to tell you, young lawyers, just because it's important. But one of my colleagues might tell it to you. You have to always verify the client's identity. The loss, you have to comply with the law society bylaws, verify the client's identity. You have to also use written retainers. It's important to um, have your relationship with clients in writing and so that if things go wrong, 
there's a relationship, uh, there's a written document that set out the scope of the, the relationship and uh, also set out how the relationship can end because you, you, you wouldn't be surprised that sometimes a client might retain you. A client might say, look, I had a problem with the police and I want you to file a YPRD or a lack of complaint, which is law enforcement complaint authority, right? They might retain you for that. And then eight to 10 months later, they say, well, oh, I had, I had retained you to sue the police for $10 million. Right? That it's a totally different ball game if you're doing a police complaint versus a civil litigation matter. And the lawyer that is hired might not even be competent to do a civil litigation matter. But you know, if you don't have a written retainer, then it's the client word against your word and the client word will prevail. So you have to have your relationship with clients put into writing. And, and you know, in 2024, you also have to uh, put the expectations in writing and um, you have to put um, contingency planning in writing. One of my colleagues who is a sole practitioner, he got a stroke in court and has been incapacitated ever since. And uh, Nia Singh, I don't know if any of you know him, but Nia, Nia got sick in court and um, rocked me to the core because Nia was in court with all his friends when he got sick, so he wasn't alone. He was doing an inquest and some of my colleagues were there with him. So, but it still rocked me to the core because, you know, he's not the same anymore. and. I don't know when he's getting back to practice, but I have to have contingency planning in place. Um, um, you should screen clients. You should screen clients. You know, some clients, some clients will you'll take on because they're high visibility clients. So their meet their media exposure alone is worth the money. They might not have money, but if they get you on television every single day. You don't need to hassle them for money because that client is paying his or her way in publicity for you. You have to take on some clients who have money because those clients with the money are going to pay for the clients without money. I have to take on cases with merit because you want to win your cases. You want them to be reported on Conley. You want them to be reported in Westlaw. And you want them to be reported in the other databases such as um, LexisNexis because I find that I have a lot of credibility with judges um, because I can cite, I can argue a whole case and cite decisions, all the decisions I cite are decisions I argued in one. It's like I was arguing a racial profiling case in Brockville of all places. And so I wrote my written submissions and it's going to be a precedent when it comes out because the judge, the judge just read my submissions as though it's his own decision. And some of the propositions of law that I put forth wasn't accepted by any court. So I'm looking forward to that decision being released. But then, you know, when you show up in court to argue racial profiling case, and you say, well, I appeared at the Supreme Court of Canada and I argued Quebec versus Bombardier and Quebec versus Bombardier adopted a decision in my own name called Peters versus Peel Law Association from the Court of Appeal. And, and you know, you go through that, you go through the test for unconscious discrimination and, and that sort of stuff. And you can cite, you can cite them from paragraph to paragraph off your head. You know, you know that you're 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 basically sometimes teaching the judge, and and if the judge trusts you, if you're if you if the judge checks all your citations, and all these citations match up with what the case law says, then obviously you've established significant credibility with the judge. You can do um, you you can do chat GPT submissions for judges. Or you, or you can't think that you can fool judges. I, I fired a young lawyer recently because in the same case in Brockville where the judge read my decision, this young lawyer wrote a whole bunch of nonsense in the submissions that I gave him to review. 
it's a case about the OPP. He's citing Peel Regional Police Policies. So I said, well, why do you have Peel Regional Police Policies cited there? He's like, oh, it's more aligned with what my thoughts are. <laughs> and I was like, no, Peel Regional Police Policies cannot govern the Ontario Provincial Police. He cites, he cites documents that were, he cites legislation that only recently came into force in 2024, in this case it's 2022. And I'm like, I'm like, you're a lawyer. How can you, how can you cite legislation that doesn't have retrospective effect? You know, when you do all this stuff, it has no credibility. So you have to, a fundamental aspect is you have to establish credibility as a law student and as a young lawyer uh, for yourself, for your colleagues and for the court. If you if you try to if you try to um if you try to bluff, I, I call it bluff because if you put in nonsense in submissions and think that you're puffing it up, it's you're trying to bluff somebody and 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 us old heads know too much to be bluffed. And and we're gonna reject you for bluffing. we we'll try to mentor you through it, but if it continues, we just lose confidence we just lose confidence in you and you wouldn't um you wouldn't really work out well it doesn't matter if you're black or white or anyone else